Hi, I'm the one that gets to figure out how this uh, works. Okay, there. Um, storytelling ha has become popular recently. Have you noticed you've heard the term several times in, in the last few years? I wrote a book called The Story Factor in the year 2000. I was introduced to storytelling after I had been studying behavioral sciences, um, social psychology, uh, group dynamics, that sort of thing. And as I sat in a tent in Jonesboro, Tennessee in 1994, listening to traditional storytellers, I was still in grad school for a master's in adult education and psychology. And I realized that while the book learning uh, was incredibly valuable, listening to these stories and meeting these storytellers was really my field research. And over time, storytelling has continued to work on me as I worked on it. And I've learned so much. It's almost like storytelling is a unifying theory of all of these different dynamics that go into why we do what we do um, and what motivates us. This particular uh, illustration, you've, you've seen, this is a photograph a friend of mine put together. You've seen the, the illustration, it's an optical illusion where you can see either the two faces or, or what, what's in the middle. This is interactive, by the way. You can tell me in German, that's okay. What's in the middle? A cup, a vase, candlestick. Uh, this, whatever it is, I want you to notice that you cannot see both at the same time. You can go back and forth really, really fast, but you can't see both at the same time. And so the, uh, the this tells me that Let's see. Uh, okay. This, this, this is how I demonstrate the fact that when we are looking at the numbers, that we really can't see the stories. And when we are looking at the stories, sometimes they don't follow the rules of the numbers. Understanding storytelling, one of the ways to, to study it is to look at the oldest and richest institutions in human history that are founded on stories. The story is their marketing campaign, their training uh, tool. What would those be? Oldest and richest institutions in human history. Catholic Church, Catholic Church or church. Hinduism, you know, is probably older. So religion uh, is founded on storytelling. And I'd like to pull some stories from different religions just to hopefully cover everybody. But the first one is a Sufi story, uh, which is the mystical arm of Islam. Nasruddin was a character that appears again and again. He's an archetype. He's the wise old fool or the foolish old wise men. You know, those come in the same package a, a lot of times. And one of the things I love about story is that it can hold paradox. Whereas when we do our linear analysis, it kind of disappears the paradox. In, th in a human interaction, you can be both wonderful and awful. You can be both in love and, uh, well, I don't know, those of you who are married, uh, you may love your spouse at the same time you want to kill them, um, you know, that sort of thing. So Nasruddin was asked to speak to a village for three weeks in a row. And on the first day, he, was a wise old fool. So he was very wise, but he hadn't really thought about what he was gonna say so that it would touch the hearts and the minds of the people. He figured he'd just wing it. How hard could it be? So he stood there and he looked out and he said, my beloved people, who amongst you knows that of which I speak? And the people said, we are poor, simple people. We do not know that of which you speak. And Nasruddin threw his robe over his shoulder and he said, well, then there is no need of me here. And he just walked right out. Well, he didn't come back in. So the next week, um, they kind of talk about this in the village, and on the second uh, time that he was to speak, he stood in front of the same people and said again, my beloved people, who amongst you knows that of which I speak? And this time they stood up and they said, we do, we know that of which you speak. And Nasruddin said, well, then there is no need of me here walked out. Well, his third and last uh, uh, time to speak was coming up. And so the people in the village came up with a plan. Now, Nasruddin had 
gone gossiping in the marketplace, shopping for camels, whatever. And again, he stood there and said, my beloved people, who amongst you knows that of which I speak? And this time, half of the village people said, we are poor, simple people. We do not know that of which you speak. And the other half stood up and they said, we do. We know that of which you speak. And Nasruddin said, well, if those of you who know will tell those who don't, then there's no need of me here. And I tell that story because it helps me explain what I do for a living. Um, you guys know storytelling. Uh, ever since you were like two or three, uh, you've had practice in storytelling. We tell stories all day long. Stories are how our brain codes what is important. Nothing is meaningful or irrelevant, but for the story we tell ourselves about it. And so as we look at campaigns, we begin to, you, it's easy to see that what we want to do is tell a story. However, the process that people go into in order to find stories and tell stories in the last, uh, last 10, 15 years has been uh, moved over to more of this linear sort of uh, uh, fact-driven, a story has a beginning, middle, and an end, which frankly, what doesn't have a beginning, middle, and an end? Uh, some of these recipes aren't quite as useful um, as, they, as, as we expected. Now, I'll see if I can do this. It's like, where do I, someone? Ah, oh, got it. Thanks. So I came up with this, this, this model, and it's, and it's based on the fact that in studying religions, you know, you always have two groups. You've got your dogma dudes that have the rule book, the Catholic Church, right? But then you also have your mystics. And your mystics are the ones that keep a personal relationship. They're the keepers of the stories, the, the poets the um, musicians, and that is based on a personal experience. And so when I look at storytelling the way I was taught is that this is where we look for our stories, not necessarily in some sort of uh, reductionist recipe that is going to produce in a factory sense the stories that we need. We have to stay present. From the Christian tradition, another story that helps me illustrate that is, um, you know, Jesus uh, during his time was actually one of the mystics. He was not one of the rule keepers. He came to bust up the rules. And so um, and, uh, in the Bible, there's a story about the, the Pharisees are trying to corner Jesus and, and get him to admit that he's wrong which is very much the either right, wrong world of this, this objective frame of thinking. And they said, isn't it against the law to heal on the Sabbath? Because it is against the law of God to work on the Sabbath. Now, if I were in the South, I would say, and what did Jesus say? However, um, actually one time I was in Alabama and this guy goes, yeah, yeah it's the ox and the whale. And I, I, I was like, the ox and the whale? Um, and he says, yeah, if your ox falls in a whale, you have to get him back out again. And the story goes that Jesus said, if your beast of burden falls into a, a ditch on Sunday, you get him out. And the reason I'm telling you this story is because of the different approach. The dogma dudes and objective thinking is all about trying to figure it out where the, there's a right and a wrong answer, where you're doing an analysis. With storytelling, it's about being inside the problem. If that were you, what would you do? And story is what makes our facts personal. And when we go into the personal, we are also in the world of ambiguity, of uncertainty, and what better tool could we have than story for dealing with ambiguity and certainty? It's kind of hard to go there on purpose because we tend to look for rules and strategies that are gonna rescue us from the ambiguity and certainty. But story is a tool that meets ambiguity and uncertainty where it lives in our personal day-to-day -day lives. One of the things about that is that it, 
that when we look for stories and the process we use, it doesn't operate the same way. We can't always predict. We can't have a recipe, one, two, three, four, that's going to be reliable every single time. And that's okay. It's hard for us because we don't do just good work. We do excellent work. And we love to know that we've crossed every T and dotted every I. And yet in storytelling, you're constantly in flux. You are living in the paradox of what it is to be a human being. And the human dilemma is still existing, existent and experiential when we are doing storytelling in the way that I was taught. Storytellers, traditional storytellers, are the keepers of the flames. We're here to remind people of big T truths. And only story can take you there. Because people, people don't want any more of your information. They're up to here with information. They don't want to hear one more damn thing from you. But I do know what they want, what they desperately want. And it's a deep human need. What they want is faith. They want faith that this is real. That you really mean what you say. That if they take action, that the results you promise will really come to pass. You know, today, cynicism is actually a status symbol. It's not cool to be enthusiastic or to believe. But what else are we trying to get people to do other than to believe and to have faith? Faith is built in to this space between two human beings, between human beings and ideals that is necessarily personal. And so storytelling is always going to be specific and is always going to be personal. The way that we keep it that way is we make sure that all of our stories are as good as experiences. Because what's the best teacher? Experience is the best teacher. Second best is a story. Because it simulates an experience and it talks to the body in its own language. What is the language of the body? Our five senses. And so when we tell a story, instead of, we take a hypothetical ideal and we translate it into something that is experientially um, meaningful. I, when I look for stories, I'm looking for a significant emotional experience. It was meaningful to you, it's likely going to be meaningful to somebody else. Um, I worked with, I do storytelling in so many different ways. It's when I first got, got, uh, got in, in touch with it, I wanted to just make my speeches better. And then I realized that it helps me facilitate, because you tell a story about, you know, that person who never shuts up before you facilitate a, a group, and then ideally the person who never shuts up kind of recognizes themselves, it kind of goes beneath the defenses. But then I began to realize that, that the story that people are telling themselves translates every piece of information that they take in. And so I began to, to see how powerful it can be. I was working with a group from the Pentagon, and they were tasked with the third year in a row coming up with budget cuts. How many of you have experienced budget cuts? So much fun, especially when you come together in a group to talk about you know, what you're going to cut. The first year, you decide, well, we, we're just going to do more with less. The second year, you decide, well, we're going to have to do less. And you, as a group in this annual meeting, decide, OK, we're going to stop doing this and this and this. But we'll keep doing that. And then during the year, you get a phone call from senior management. And they say, you know what? I understand you have to stop doing something, but you can't stop doing this, this, and this. And so then you're doing it all again. And so at that third year, they were so frustrated and angry. And these are military people anyway. Um, so, so I'm asked to facilitate. And um, 
I thought, okay, I gotta do something a, a little different here. So I decided to use storytelling, and, and particularly in, in the form of, of poetry. Because the story that somebody tells themselves colors everything that they think and do. In this particular way, I wanted to talk about testosterone. And they looked at me like, did she just say that? In I said, testosterone is your friend in a war fighting situation. As a matter of fact, traditional storytellers have used stories to, to generate more testosterone because what it does is helps you keep focused. It blocks out any sense of your own pain or suffering of others so that you can do the one thing that you're there to do is achieve your objective. A good example of that, they use rock and roll, you know, to stimulate that, but uh, pulling from H Henry V, once more into the breach, dear friends, once more, or fill this wall up with our noble dead. In peace, nothing so becomes a man as modest stillness, but when the winds of war blast in the ears, summon up the blood, disguise fair nature with hard favored rage, take on the aspect of the tiger. Let the eye pry through the portage of the head as doth a, a brass cannon. Let the brow o'erwhelm it like a galled rock or hang an or jetty, its confounded base over the wild and wasteful ocean. And by the time I finish this, they're all going, hoo, hoo, hoo. <laughs> Okay, okay, that's testosterone and that's gonna help you win a war. However, we were here to make some budget decisions and this group, <laughs> was actually supposed to be taking care of people's, uh, the, the, the soldiers and their families. And so I said, that's a different story. We approach this from a different, different point of view. Let's, I pulled a, a poem again, using poetry with the Pentagon is, is one of the craziest things I've ever done. Um, but this is the unknown soldier. Uh, there's a graveyard near the White House where the unknown soldier lies, and the flowers there are sprinkled with the tears from mother's eyes. I stood th there not so long ago with flowers for the brave, and suddenly I heard a voice come from out the grave. I am the unknown soldier, the spirit voice began, and I think I have the right to ask some questions man to man. Are my buddies taken care of? Was their victory so sweet? Is that big reward you offered selling pencils in the street? I wonder if we really won the freedom we battled to achieve. Do you still respect the crotiger above the empty sleeve? I wonder if the profiteers have satisfied their greed. This happens sometimes. <laughs> I wonder if a soldier's mother ever is in need. I wonder if the kings who planned it all are really satisfied. They played their game of checkers and 11 million died. I am the unknown soldier and perhaps I died in vain, but if I were alive and my country called, I'd do it all again. The atmosphere in the room changed dramatically. From that point on, the conversation was a completely different conversation than it would have been had we not turned and experienced this day through a different story. Story has, a power, has the power to completely change the outcome of what you say, of what meaning people draw from it. Facts are not as powerful as feelings. Feelings can completely distort facts. And so when we think about our facts, we have to think about the story and the context in which they're embraced. Because only a story can give them meaning, the sort of meaning that builds faith and it helps people really believe. Because that's what we need right now. That's the only thing that really makes a campaign successful, is to really believe that you are the right people 
doing the right things for the right reasons. Thanks.